Hi, everyone. <laughs> it's nice to see everybody. Friends, I'm John Cavadini. I'm the director of the Institute for Church Life here at the University of Notre Dame. Friends, as you know, our speaker this evening is the Apostolic Nuncio to the United States. And as you know, the Apostolic Nuncio is the official representative of the Holy See to the United States. And he serves as ambassador to our nation, but also as the official liaison between the Holy See and the Episcopate, that is between the Holy See and all of the local churches in our country. And so it's appropriate then for us to begin, I've asked, I've asked Bishop Rhodes, Bishop Kevin Rhodes, our own local ordinary, if he would open our conference for us, welcoming the Apostolic Nuncio to our diocese, our local church, in which the University of Notre Dame is located, and welcoming us all, and then opening with a prayer. So please join me in welcoming our local bishop, Bishop Kevin C. Rhodes. Thank you very much, John. And um, I'm very happy and honored to welcome you to the Diocese of Fort Wayne, South Bend, especially our Apostolic Nuncio, Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano. Archbishop Vigano arrived yesterday to a rather exciting experience, um, you know, with our football game. And, uh, and I, I've been feeling very guilty all day, and I thought I should make a general confession to this audience tonight, and that is when Pitt was attempting that field goal that was missed, I asked Our Lady to deflect it, and, and I feel so bad for that young man, but um, so I'm doing penance now, uh, but it really, as I said, it's a joy to welcome the Archbishop and all of you to this important conference, uh, Seed of the Church telling the story of today's Christian martyrs. This important theme needs to receive greater prominence in our nation and in the consciousness of people worldwide. I think of the words in the Acts of the Apostles when St. Peter was being kept in prison. It says in Acts, prayer was made without ceasing by the church to God for him. And I hope and pray that this conference will not only lead to greater awareness and knowledge about the persecution of Christians in the world today and violations of religious freedom, but also the uplifting in prayer for our persecuted brothers and sisters, as well as action on behalf of justice and religious liberty by governments and other organizations. And I am deeply grateful to Professor John Cavadini and the, and the Institute for Church Life here at Our Lady's University for this conference. It's a special joy to welcome all of our excellent presenters who will speak during these days and also all who are participating. And now I'd like to begin with a prayer, and I took this prayer from the special mass for persecuted Christians. It's the collect of that mass. O oh God, who in your inscrutable providence will that the church be united to the sufferings of your son, grant, we pray, to your faithful who suffer for your name's sake a spirit of patience and charity, that they may be found true and faithful witnesses to the promises you have made. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Our Lady, Queen of Martyrs, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Bishop Rhodes. Friends, just a few remarks about the spirit of our conference and intent. 
Tertullian, the fiery North African theologian who died about the year 220, was famous for the, for the dramatic and pointed sayings which punctuate the sometimes hard and jagged landscape of his writings. The title of our conference comes from one of these sayings. In the last chapter of his work entitled Apology or Defense, Tertullian famously stated that the blood of Christians is seed. He did not say seed of the church, though some qualifier must be supplied if the phrase is to be used for a conference title. What did Tertullian mean? If we read the whole chapter, instead of just the saying, we will see he meant that the witness of the martyrs prompts contemplation of that very witness. And that such contemplation, as it deepens, gives rise to an inquiry about what the witness was a witness to, or a witness of. And that this, in turn, inspired conversion. Thus the church grew from the supernatural seed of the martyr's witness. If we examine Tertullian's logic, it will give us the key to understanding the aim of our current conference, at least the reason that I chose the phrase, besides the fact that it's famous. The blood of Christians is seed. Where should the seed fall? Surely, friends, it must fall first in our own hearts. The heart is the place of memory. For this seed to fall into our hearts means to accept the memory of the martyrs as a sacred trust and as a treasure to be pondered in the heart. Of course, I mean all of the martyrs of Christian history and all of those of any faith who die for the sake of any truly human and humane value. But here I mean especially the memory of those Christians who have been martyred for the practice of their faith and in the practice of their faith in today's world. One thinks, for example, of Nigerian Catholics in a crowded church in Kaduna into which just a week ago a suicide bomber drove a jeep killing eight and injuring more than 100. More generally, I'm thinking of the recent estimate of the International Society for Human Rights according to which Christians make up about 80% of those who are persecuted for their religion in the world. In countries such as India, Vietnam, Iraq, Colombia, Pakistan, Nigeria, Mexico, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, North Korea, Sri Lanka, China, Indonesia, and others. Several of these places are home to some of the most ancient Christian communities in the world. Yet this problem is underreported in the secular media and seemingly ignored by many, if not much, of secular academia. Hence this conference, to allow the seed of the Christian witness to the point of death to enter into our hearts precisely as seed. To hold the memory of the martyrs in one's heart means, as Tertullian recognized, to contemplate what it means and to be moved by that to a deeper conversion. The martyrdom is a witness in love to the God who is love. Only in contemplating this witness can we start meaningfully to ask the question, why is this massive problem ignored? I'm sure the reasons are complex and it is easy to point fingers, but as always, we should start with ourselves. The blood of the martyrs should be seed that first prompts a deeper conversion of our own hearts. Persecution always arises from hardness of heart. Are any of us immune to this hardness of heart? Or can we not, if we are honest, find it right there in our own heart? The blood of the martyrs, if it is truly seed, should be the growing point of a loving memory. As the seed grows, it allows us first to see more clearly our own investment in the various forms of hardness of heart. This awareness leads in turn to a deeper conversion of our own hearts away from the hatred and fear that only feed persecution far from stopping it. But if the seed does grow, it will enable us to look squarely at the problem, 
to have the courage to speak about it and not let it be hid in false politeness, and to discern and take appropriate actions of advocacy. We will have this courage and discernment if we truly are speaking out of love, if we truly let the blood shed for the God of love become more and more a seed of love, something to be treasured in the deepest recesses of our own hearts, whence springs all witness that is genuine, true, and ultimately able to become seed itself. So thank you. Now, friends, I would like to recognize and welcome to the podium our own university president, Father John Jenkins, who will introduce our speaker for tonight. Thank you, John. And before I introduce our speaker, I want to thank uh, Bishop Rhodes for his presence among us. Universities are, are a complicated place, but one thing a Catholic university must be is a place that uh, provides a forum for dialogues in union with and service to the church. And I think Bishop Rhodes' presence with us tonight helps remind us of that and uh, helps nurture that spirit. And I, I just have to thank John Cavadini and the Institute for Church Life. Uh, I need say no more than that eloquent introduction John gave to say, to give evidence that John understands in a profound way how our life at this university should be in union with and in service to the church. So we're just, for that reason, tremendously pleased to host this conference and uh, to, to uh, invite our, our distinguished speaker tonight, who I will introduce now. His Excellency, Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano is the Apostolic Nuncio to the United States, a post he's held since October 19th, 2011. I mention that date not simply for chronology, but because he is significant for our, our conference. It is the feast of the North American martyrs, and Archbishop Vigano chose that date for his, the announcement of his appointment as an act of solidarity with the church in the United States in the person of the early martyrs on this continent. Archbishop Vigano was ordained a priest on March 24, 1968, in the Diocese of Pavia, Italy. After earning a doctorate in both civil and canon law, he entered the dip diplomatic service of the Holy See in 1973. Among other assignments in his early days, he worked in the papal diplomatic mission in Iraq and Great Britain, and was then named Special Envoy and Permanent Observer of the Holy See to the Council of Europe in Strasbourg on April 4, 1989. On April 3, 1992, Blessed Pope John Paul II appointed him titular Archbishop of Upania and Arch Apostolic Nuncio to Nigeria. Archbishop Vigano established a reputation as a hands-on nuncio, willing to travel by jeep even to troubled and dangerous locations at a time when he was warned that his life would be in great danger. But for Archbishop Vigano, there was no effective diplomacy at arm's length and no true love for a country and his church without the personal contact that marks all human friendships. Archbishop Vigano is no stranger to situations in which, in which the church suffers violence and persecutions, and his solidarity with the Nigerian church was recognized when Pope John Paul II visited that country in 1997. In 2009, Archbishop Vigano was appointed Secretary General of the Vatican City Gubernatorate. In his time in the Gubernatorate, his time in the Gubernatorate was marked by an insistence on centralized accounting procedures and fiscal accountability. He earned a reputation as a careful administrator, skilled at improving efficiency of an office that oversees the care of the Vatican buildings, as well as the Vatican Post Office, Police Force, and the Vatican Museums. Archbishop, if you're ever looking for a job, we have, with that resume, we have a place for you here at Notre Dame. <laughs> In November 2010, the Archbishop was called upon to represent the Vatican in the Gem General Assembly of Interpol, the International Cooperative Organization for Police Agencies, in his speech to the Assembly. Drawing upon his personal experience in the country, he highlighted 
the ongoing violence against Christians in Iraq. He also commented more generally about the Vatican's conviction that the promotion of human rights is the best strategy for combating, in for combating inequalities that lead to crime and terrorism. We in the United States have received a great gift from Pope Benedict in appointing as our nuncio, one of the Holy See's most seasoned diplomats, a humanitarian by character and accomplishments, and someone who has stood in solidarity with Christians vulnerable to violence for the practice of faith. We are pleased and honored to welcome His Excellency Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano to the University of Notre Dame. So please join me in warmly welcoming the Archbishop to the podium for his talk entitled Religious Freedom, Persecution of the Church, and Martyrdom. Thank you, Father, for your introduction. I am being reminded that just recently, and in a few days, I am going to be honored by the price of humility. After what you have said, certainly, maybe it would be appropriate to have an act of humility from my side. You know much more of my life than what I remember. So <laughs> <that> I, <laughs> Anyway, thank you, Bishop. First of all, I should like to thank you, Professor John Cavadini, Professor of Theology and Director of Institute of Church Life, for this kind invitation to be with you today to discuss an important set of interrelated topics. Religious freedom, the persecution of Christians around the world, and the martyrdom. But before I begin this task, I should also like to thank the University of Notre Dame for its sponsorship of this important conference, and especially its president, Father John Jenkins, for his hospitality, and for giving me the opportunity to get to know this prestigious institution of the church. I also extend my fraternal and prayerful best wishes to the Most Reverend Kevin Rhodes, Bishop of Fort Wayne, South Bend, for his participation to this event and his warm welcome. As you may know, I am the representative of His Holiness Pope Benedict XVI to the United States. And so in consideration of this official office, I hold an exercise. I acknowledge to you all my profound gratitude to be with you today in order to address this important and timely subject. It has been a part of my personal makeup and official duty to monitor and register concern to my superiors about effort to harm intentionally or otherwise, the church and God's people. I realize that you have scheduled several prominent speakers who will address critical questions dealing with religious freedom, persecution of the Christians, and martyrdom in the present day around the globe. I do not wish to compete with them, nor is my intention to preempt their incise with an insightful comment, which I'm confident will elevate the mindfulness of your audience and potential readership about religious freedom, religious persecution, and martyrdom. Countries and regions where these challenges to the faithful exist are in all continents in China, in Asia, Africa, Europe, subcontinent, Middle East, Latin America. Let me illustrate the problems in this country with one example. The circumstances which our brothers and sisters in faith 
experience in the People's Republic of China are largely well known by many who follow international development. The anguish which the Church faces in China has led Pope Benedict XVI to issue his 2007 letter to the Church in China to lay to late the faithful of that great country and of the world know that the Universal Church has not forgotten them and their faithful witness to Christ and to Christ's vicar on earth. Similar problems exist elsewhere. In nearby Pakistan and India, Christians face intimidation, sometimes with little consequences, which the civil authorities of these respective states seem incapable of arresting. Elsewhere, there are new pressures placed on religious freedom in the Middle East, especially in Iraq and now in Syria, in, part, in parts of Africa, including Egypt, Nigeria, the Sudan, and East Africa. The heavy burdens imposed on Christians in all of these regions can be, and often are, physical and harsh. In some instances, the faithful have witnessed their Christian faith at the experience of their life, which God gave them. In this regard, the heavy hand of so-called anti-blasphemy laws has sometimes been the method to subjugate the Christian faith. In all of these instances, we see that the faithful persist in their fidelity to Jesus Christ and his Holy Church. For throughout her history, the Church has gained strength when persecuted. We must recall the words of the preface of the Holy Martyrs from the second edition of the Roman Missal. God chooses the weak and makes them strong. In short, with God's help we can prevail, but without him, even our greatest human strength is insufficient because it is frail. As a papal nuncio to the United States, I realize that I speak from a distinguished podium of the great university. And it is my intention to propose for your consideration the interrelated matters of religious freedom, persecution, and martyrdom that are or should be of vital concern to you, for this grave concern exists not only abroad, but they also exist within your own homeland. In order to establish a framework for my presentation, several key definitions are in order. I will first address the subject of martyrdom. What is it and why is relevant to you today? I am sure that most, if not all of us, are familiar with the martyrs of the church, both past and present, who gave of their life because they would not compromise on the principle of faith that accompany the call of discipleship. There is the experience of great suffering that often includes torture and death. Some of the early martyrs of the church experienced this through cruelty, often by slow means, designed to bring on, de to bring on death. However, the intention underlying the objective of the persecutor is important to understand. It was to eradicate the public witness to Jesus Christ and his church. An accompanying 
objective can be the incapacitation of the faith by inciting people to renounce their belief, or at least their public manifestations, rather they undergo great hardship that will be or can be applied if believers persist in their resistance to apostasy. The plan is straightforward. If the faith persists, so will the hardships. In more recent times, martyrdom may not necessitate to torture or death. However, the objective of those who desire to harm the faith may choose the path of ridiculing the believers so that they become outcasts from the mainstream society and marginalized from the meaningful participation in the public life. This brings me to the meaning of persecution. Persecution is typically associated with the deeds preceding those necessary to make martyrs for the faith. While acts of persecution can mirror those associated with the martyrdom, other elements can be directed to sustaining difficulty, annoyance, and harassment that are designed to frustrate the beliefs or to target person or persons rather than to eliminate these persons. It would seem then that the objective of the persecution is to remove from the public square the beliefs themselves and the public manifestation without necessarily eliminating the person who all the beliefs. The victimization may not be designed to destroy the believer, but only the belief and it is open manifestations. From the public point of view, the believer remains, but the faith eventually disappears. In the context of martyrdom and persecution, the law enforcement branches of the state can be relied upon to achieve the desired goal. The state enforcement mechanism were surely employed in a campaign that brought the death of the early martyrs in Rome. The legal mechanism of the new legis legislation and its enforcement in Tudor England were relied upon in the persecution and martyrdom of Thomas More and John Fisher. As one thinks, about these two heroic individuals, you can see the multiple objective of the state. The first, in the sequential order, were words and then deeds designed to encourage through pressure more and Fisher to accept the king's and parliament's will to agree with the divorce of King Henry from Queen Catherine. However, when Fisher and Moore remain resolving their fidelity to the church's teaching about the validity of the marriage, but discreet in how they did so, the state mechanism designed to bring them and their views around where they reaching up so as to increase the pressure on them. When they resisted the increase of pressures, st statutes were enacted and amended to make not compliance of treasonable and therefore a capital offense. It was understood by Fisher, Moore, and King's agents that hideous death rather than lesser punishment was, was the inevitable penalty. 
It is said that while torture was recommended by some of the essence, the complies, the Fisher and more, the king conscience would not permit it. Nevertheless, when increased level of persecution did not achieve the desired result of modifying the views of Fisher and more, martyrdom by beheading rather than hanging, drawing or quartering was the inevitable solution. In the cases of Fisher and more, persecution came first and then it was followed by martyrdom. In both cases, religious freedom was the target. I now turn to religious freedom. What is it? Religious freedom is the exercise of fidelity to God and to his holy church without compromise. Human action that reflects this fidelity is what has has a martyrdom and, and persecution for many believers of the past and of today. At the core of this fidelity is the desire to be a good citizen of the two cities where we all live, the city of man and the city of God. This kind of dual citizenship necessitated libertas Ecclesia, it has the freedom of the church. This freedom is essential to the religious freedom, which properly belongs to human person. And this freedom that belongs to human person is simultaneously a human, civil, and natural right, which is not conferred by the state because it subsists in the human person's nature. As a papal representative of the Holy See to the United States, the subject of religious liberty frequently surfaces in the international discussions that constitute a major part of my priestly service to our church, to the Holy Father and to you, my dear friends. It is evident that there is a pressing need to protect religious freedom around the world. However, this freedom is not something that can or should be imposed for it subsists in the truth of God. Trust can impose, truth can impose itself on the human mind by force of his own truth, which wins over the mind and both gentleness with both gentleness and power. That there is recognition by many people of goodwill about this truth is reassuring, given the fact that religious persecution and martyrdom are still present in the world today. This recognition, however, is often challenged by alarms registered by skeptics who question whether it is proper for there to be a public role for religion in civil life. We live in an age where most but not all of your fellow countrymen still share in the conviction that Americans are essentially a religious people. While current data suggest a progressive decline in religious belief across the Western world, including the United States, there still appears to be deference given to the importance of religion. But as just have been indicated, there are those who question where, whether religion 
or religious belief should have a role in public life and civic affairs. The problem of persecution begins with this reluctance to accept the public role of religion in these affairs, especially but not always when the protection of religious freedom involves beliefs that the powerful of the political society do not share. Thus, we are presented with the pressing question about whether the devout religious believer, let us say the Catholic, can have a right to exercise citizenship in the most robust fashion when his or her views on civic concerns are informed by the faith. The First Amendment of the United States Constitution more than suggests an affirmative answer to this question. But we should not be satisfied with this recognition. After all, important figures, some of whom hold high public office, are speaking today about the right of freedom of worship, but their discourse fails to acknowledge that there is also a complementary right about the encumbered ability to exercise religious faith in a responsible, at the same time, public manner. In the remaining time that is allotted to me, I shall focus on these concerns and the emerging deleterious impact on the authentic and legitimate exercise of religious freedom within your great country. Let me address the concern that I, I see about this fundamental and non-derogable right on your home front. Let me begin by briefly stating that as a man of God and therefore a man of hope, it is essential to pray for a just resolution of the issues which face the faithful and their fidelity. As you may know, the bishops of the United States conducted earlier this year the fourth night for freedom. And more recently, in October, a novena for life and liberty in order to elevate prayerful consciousness and other responsibilities of the faithful to ensure protection of the first freedom cherished by your nation. One compelling catalyst for this initiative is found in the legitimate concerns about religious liberty posed by the uncertainties surrounding the patient protection of the Affordable Care Act However, this is by no means the only source of concern. When Catholic charities and business owned by faithful Catholics experience pressure to alter their cherished belief, the problem is experienced in other venues. In short, the menace to, re the menace to religious liberty is concrete on many fronts. Evidence is emerging which demonstrates that the threat to religious freedom is not solely a concern for non-democratic or totalitarian regimes. Unfortunately, it is surfacing with greater regularity in what many consider the great democracy of the world. This is a, a tragedy, not only for not only the believer, but also for democratic society. 
Here we must consider the important point that the religious freedom is not an end in itself, because it has and at its higher purpose protection of the ultimate dignity of the human person. The argument was acknowledged by Pope Paul VI at the conclusion of the Second Vatican Council in his address to the rulers of nations when he rhetorically asked the question, what does the church seek from you? I quote, she asks of you only liberty, the liberty to believe and to preach her faith, the freedom to love God and to serve him, the freedom to live and to bring the man to man her message of life. Do not fear her. She is made in the image of her master whose mysterious action does not interfere with your prerogative, but heals everything human and his fatal weakness, transfigures it and fills it with hope, truth, and beauty. Pope the Sixth, Paul the Sixth was continuing, allow Christ to exercise his purifying action in, on society. And we, his humble ministers, allow us to spread everywhere without hindrance the gospel of peace. Our feet, your people, will be the first beneficiaries since the church forms for you loyal citizens, friends of social peace and progress. One illustration of interference with religious freedom as outlined by Pope Paul recently surfaced in England which has a Christian past and for centuries was one place where Christianity flourished. The 2010 decision of an English court in the case of Johns versus Derby City Council, Queen's Bench Division, has essentially declared that an evangelical Christian couple is unfit to be legal guardians for foster children because of their faith, which informs them that certain sexual expression by consenting adults are seen. Mr. and Mrs. Johns, a devout evangelical couple, had successfully and lovingly served as foster parents for needy children in the past. In spite of their previous exemplary service, caring for children who needed love and protection, the civil authorities of the United Kingdom expressed grave reservation about the continuing suitability of Christians who firmly pursue their Christian faith. As a result of the court's decision, the exercise of religious faith, which is protected in theory by judicial text, is in fact subject to forfeit. And the judges noted in their decision the belief of Mr. and Mrs. Johns is based on religious precepts which can be divisive, capricious, and arbitrary. Paradoxically, Mr. and Mrs. Johns were doing what is clearly protected by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, texts which your nation claims to adhere to, and in the case of covenant, is a party. The John's religious freedom was sacrificed to, the pra to practices which are today considered 
rights by many well-educated persons, but which are not mentioned in the applicable juridical text as is religious, as is religious freedom. If George Orwell were still alive today, he would certainly have material to write a sequel to his famous novel 1984, in which the totalitarian state, among other things, found effective means for distancing children from their parents and monopolizing the control of education processes, especially on moral issues. I am sure that John's case will be discussed much more in the future. But we must take stock of the fact that the challenges to authentic religious freedom are not relegated to distant places such as England. My concern about religious liberty and my effort to protect them have a bearing on what is presently going on in the United States. Over the past months, we have heard much about the legitimate reservation raised by the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops that per pertain to authentic religious freedom and the proper exercise of faith in public. The issues and reservation identified by the conference president, Cardinal Dolan, about the health care mandate dealing with the artificial contraception abortion, inducing drugs, and sterilization are very real, and they pose grave threat to the vitality of Catholicism in the United States. But we must not forget the other peril to the religious liberty that your great country has experienced in recent years. Once again, we see that the rule of law in the contents of your first amendment and important international protection for religious freedom has been pushed aside. Let me cite some examples of these other hazards. A few years ago, the federal courts of the United States considered the case of Parker against Early, in which a number of families were alarmed over the curriculum of the public school in Lexington, Massachusetts. Ironically, one of the cradle of liberty, where young children were obliged to learn about family diversity as presented in the children's book that elevated a natural and wholesome same-sex relation in marriage. The Parker family and other families who are Judeo-Christian believers <coughs> wished to pursue an opt-out for their children from this instruction. While they may not have been aware of it, their sensible plan reflected sound and reasonable rights that are addressed and protect by international human rights standards which are echoes in the Declaration of the Religious Liberty, Dignitatis Humanae of the Second Vatican Council. However, the civil authorities and the federal courts disagreed with and thereby denied the lawful claim of these parents who were trying to protect their children from the morally unacceptable. If these children were to remain in public schools, they had to participate in the indoctrination of the public school taught was proper for young taught, taught that was proper for young children. Put simply, religious freedom was forcefully 
push aside once again. More recently, we recall the Federal Court Review of Proposition 8 in California. The legal proceedings surrounding this initiative dealing with the meaning of marriage, George Van Walker said this about religious exercise, a freedom enshrined in your constitution. Religious belief that gay and lesbian relationships are sinful or inferior to heterosexual relationships harm gays and lesbians. This harm cited by the judge became the basis for devising a mechanism used to minimize, if not eradicate, the free exercise of religion, which includes the vigorous participation of the religious believer in public and political life. Another front, we have witnessed Catholic charities across the United States being removed from vital social services that advance the common good because upright people administering these programs would not adopt policy or engage in procedures that violate fundamental moral principle of the Catholic faith. Furthermore, we have observed influential members of the national American community, especially public official and university faculty members who profess to be Catholic, align with those forces that are pitted against the church in fundamental moral teaching dealing with critical issues such as abortion, population control, redefinition of marriage, embryonic stem cell commodification, and problematic adoption, to name but a few. In regard to teachers, especially university and college professors, we have witnessed that some instructors who claim the moniker Catholic are often the, source, the sources of teachings that conflict with, rather than explain and defend Catholic teaching in the important public policy issues of the day. While some, while some of these faculty members are affiliated with non-Catholic institution of higher learning, others teach at institutions that hold themselves out to be Catholic. This, my brothers and sisters, is a grave and major problem that challenges the first freedom of religious liberty and the higher purpose of the human person. History can help us understand what is happening in the present moment to this first freedom. Catholics have in the past experienced and weathered the storms that have threatened religious freedom. In this context, we recall that Pope Pius XI took steps to address these grave problems in his 1931 encyclical letter, Non abbiamo bisogno dealing with the religious persecution of the faithful by the fascists in Italy. And in 1937 letter, meet Brendan Sorge, addressing parallel threat initiated by the National Socialists in Germany. In the context of Germany, during the reign of National Socialism, we recall that the Oxford professor Nathaniel Mittler examined and discussed the persecution of the Catholic Church in Germany in his 1939 book entitled National Socialism 
and the Roman Catholic Church. The problem identified by Mitchell over six decades ago, over six decades ago that deal with the heavy grip of the state's hand in authentic religious liberty are still with us today. An Englishman who found his way to the United States, Christopher Dawson, who became a Catholic in his early adulthood, still reminds us that modern state, even the democratic one, can exert all kinds of pressure on authentic religious freedom. Dawson insightfully explained that modern democratic state can join the totalitarian one in not being satisfied with passive obedience when it demands full cooperation from the cradle to the grave. He identified the challenges that secularism and secular societies can impose on Christians which surface on the cultural and political levels. Dawson thus warned that if Christians cannot assert the right to exist, then they, be, they will be eventually be pushed not only out of the modern culture, but out of physical existence. He acknowledged that this was not only a problem in a totalitarian, a totalitarian and non-democratic state, but it will also become the issue in England and in America if we do not use our opportunities while we still have them. While Dozen made his observation in the 1950s, we need to recall that Blessed John Paul II recognized the durability of the problems noticed by Dozen during the era that saw the collapse of the modern Soviet totalitarian state. In his 1991 encyclical Centesimus Annus, John Paul reminds us that totalitarianism attempts to destroy the church, or at least to reduce her to submission, making her an instrument of his own ideological apparatus. But he further noted that this threat is not solely expressed by the state established on dictatorship, for it can also be exercised by a democracy, for, I state, a democracy without values easily turns into openly and thinly disguised totalitarianism. Since the conclusion of the Second World War and the formation of the United Nations, democracy around the world have periodically exhibited threats of, of this new totalitarian, totalitarianism that emerges from a democracy without values values that must be based on the timeless and universal moral principles adhered to and taught by our church because these principles are founded on the truth of Christ which came to set us free. So what can be done? Cardinal Dolan has recently exhorted the Catholic faithful to confront the challenges which the faith faces today. His brother bishops in this country and around the world 
have taken similar action. It is a desperate day when well-educated persons label this effort as attempts by the hierarchy to control the activity of Catholics in public life. Some have even criticized publicly Cardinal Dolan's call to the faithful to defend the Catholic contribution to political debate in this fashion. Dolan, to lay Catholics, be our attractive, articulate, and unpaid flux. I pay that the authors meant well in saying this. In spite of the statement's disparaging tone, but this person failed to recall the nature of the church as explained by the Second Vatican Council and reiterated by the blessed John Paul II in his apostolic exhortation, Christi Fidelis Laici. In this exhortation, the Pope urged the lay faithful to be mindful of their crucial role in temporal affairs as disciples of Christ rather than as element of some political or sec secular ideology that bases its platform on an in a indecipherable formula established on the ambiguous foundation thus unsuccessfully relies on the cure of social justice. It is proper function of bishop to be teachers of the faith, but it is also true that the laity exercise a major role in implementing the same faith in the affairs of the world. This is why John Paul repeatedly encouraged the faithful with the words of Jesus, you go into my vineyard too, in order to respond affirmatively to this call, religious freedom is essential. We are still far, a far cry from fully embracing the Holy Father's encouraging exhortation when we witness in an un unprecedented way a platform be, being as assumed by a major political party, having intrinsic, intrinsic evil among its basic principle, and Catholic faithful publicly supporting it. There is a divisive strategy at work here, an intentional dividing of the church. Through this strategy, the body of the church is weakened, and thus the church can be more easily persecuted. We must all be mindful that our Lord noted time and again that each member of the church, clerical, religious, or lay, is a branch on the vine of Christ. It is our unity with him. We are a part of something universal, one faith, one belief displaying to the variety of talents in a multiplicity of places. This is what our Lord asks us to do. And therefore, this is what we must do, to preach and live the good news and to do so in a communion with our Lord, with the successor of his apostles and with his vicar. It is our faith and it is our duty to live and proclaim the gospel to the church's teaching so that by reason proposition, not imposition, God's will and our discipleship can advance the common good for every member of the human family. This, my friend, is essential 
to attend to religious freedom because it is the means by which we fulfill the destiny of human person. And so let us go into the Lord's vineyard together with love, hope, freedom, the firmness of the conviction of our faith, and the help that God so willingly extends to us. We have been appointed by God and his holy church to go forth and bear much fruit. Let us do so with the freedom and his necessary com complement responsibility which God has given us. We further know that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. What God has given, the servant state does not have the competence to remove. And God has given us the truth of his son, the truth who give us the most precious freedom of all, which is the desire to be with God forever. This is our destiny, and this is why religious freedom, as I have explained, it is a paramount importance. It is essential to the exercise of our other rights and responsibility as citizens of the two cities. Thank you very much. <laughs>